the material in. So it really is very analogous. I mean, the main difference is you're getting two photons out here instead of one. Uh, but you could imagine uh, a two-photon spontaneous emission process. Typically, these things are very weak and not very much studied, but they do exist. So there's no seeding at all? Um, you can, of course, seed the process. Okay? And the, the classical limit that I talked about is when you do seed it. And I think that's analogous to a classical calculation you can make for an atom in an excited state. If you come in with a very strong classical field, you will get stimulated emission. You can calculate that classically to good approximation. Okay? And you know, that's, that's the classical, the driven kind of process. I think there is an interesting regime that hasn't really been looked at very much, uh, and that is when the seeding is at the one or two photon level because then the seeding is equiv you know, equivalent in strength to the spontaneous process. And I think that's a, that's a very interesting regime to look at. It's the kind of regime that becomes important when you go, when you push these, uh, you push these effects very, very far and you start to get away from just generating pairs of photons to basically generating beams at the two signal and the idler frequency. And then you basically make an optical parametric oscillator or an, or an optical parametric amplifier. Okay? So that's in some sense the classical limit of this process. Your photons at that point are, are in a much more uh, complicated state that however is much more like a classical state. Right? So you don't want to be in that limit if you want to do quantum information processing, but of course there's all kinds of reasons why one would like to build efficient OPOs and OPAs, and I think that can be done in these ring structures much more efficiently than, has, than, you know, than, than people have done so far in bulk structures or in channel structures. So I think even in the classical regime, looking at OPA and OPO structures with these ring structures is going to be very exciting. In these high frequency materials, losses Well, right, right. Now, you can, if you're talking about a chi 3 process such as, it depends on the material. I mean, if you have, um, if you have something like glass, uh, then there's going to be essentially no loss. Okay? If you, if optical glass, if you have something like silicon, uh, there will be two photon absorption of the pump. That will generate carriers that if the carriers are allowed to hang around long enough can start to absorb uh, the, the signal and idler photons that are generated. If you sweep them out fast enough, you can maybe minimize that. In the chalcogenides, the figure of merit for two-photon absorption is great, I'm told. So we don't have to worry about two-photon absorption in chalcogenide glasses. But the main loss process, I think, will not be absorption, but will be scattering out of these channel structures. Okay? And that's what's, that's what's important to minimize. Now we've done some rough calc we've done some preliminary calculations of how um, scatter scattering loss, that is loss of photons out of the out of the structure, will degrade entanglement. And it does degrade entanglement, but only at the absorption rate. Okay? There are many cases where you will degrade entanglement faster than an energy loss rate. But in these processes, the, the loss due to scattering out of the channel seems to degrade the entanglement only at the loss rate. And that's not too bad a hit. So I'm optimistic with respect to that, but it, you're, you're quite right. It's a very good question. It's a subject that um, has really has not been explored by anybody as far as I know. Just to follow up, what's the, what's the mechanism that limits the Q factor of the equality of the rings? In the... Um, in almost all the rings that I'm aware of, it's scattering loss. Why? I really like this idea that the resonator changes the lifetime of, of the uh, spontaneous emission, or the fluctuation. Mm -hmm. And it seems kind of similar to, to local density space items, where the, the resonator will move the states in the spectrum. Yes. There's also a kind of conservation of lifetime there, that when mm -hmm. every photon would be allowed to fluctuate, then they can all last for a lifetime, for a, an optical cycle, when they're only allowed to fluctuate in a ring, 
Is the same thing happening? So swept all those lifetimes? I would guess that's what's going on. Um, I don't, uh, we have not done a density of states calculation for this. I mean, the, the calculation that we've done has been, yeah, by a different, uh, different quantum optical strategy. It's not been through a density of states. Because we've wanted to focus on the case where I get not, where if I have a CW beam on maybe for three days or something, I'm going to get many pairs out, and we wanted to be able to describe that. So we haven't done the simpler density of states calculation, but that's an extremely good suggestion. I mean, that should be done, and I, but I would guess you're right, that that's indeed what's going on, that there is a, a, it's, a it's another counting procedure that's doing it, yeah. Um, I think it's more practical reasons than deep reasons. I mean, although it is, if you have a fabric perot structure, for example, you know, you, the light comes in, some will go this way, some will go that way, okay? With one of these single channel ring structures, it's an all pass filter. Everything goes in one direction. So you don't have to worry about things going in different directions. It's why do you look at a, you know, why do you look at a, a, a ring laser rather than a, rather than a you know, sort of a regular laser? For a lot of reasons, when you have one things going in one direction, a lot of the physics is easier. So I think that's one advantage uh, of working with these. Uh, the other, I think, is just the simple way it couples with a, um, it couples with a channel waveguide. One could imagine building a fabric pro with some sort of grading structure and so on. But as I mentioned, you're all, always, fighting, always fighting scattering losses. And anything you can do to minimize any additional structure uh, is, is going to help. I mean, that being said, as I indicated on, on the slide before this, I think all these other structures should be looked at. I'm not sure a ring structure is the best. I'm not at all sure it's the best. It's the one I happen to get interested in looking at, so we made a lot of calculations on it. But I think all kinds of resonance structures have possibilities for enhancing these processes. And which is going to be the best at the end of the day? Yeah, probably depends on a lot of things that we don't understand yet. Well, I've got one question. You, you referred to entangled photons, and then you referred to correlated photons. And at some point, you said these photons would not be entangled, but they would be correlated. And some of the audience might be scratching their head and saying, just remind me, when are they entangled and when are they correlated? Can you be expanding on that? Right. So classical things can, of course, be correlated. Um, if I take a penny here and split it in half, and I always send the heads this way and said send the tails that way, or maybe sometimes I send the tails this way and the heads that way, there's always a correlation between what people at these two ends are going to measure. So there's a strict correlation there. One gets heads, the other one gets tails. Okay. Entanglement is a more subtle correlation than that, which I, which I can't explain in a few minutes, but it basically means that in the two parts, that neither of the two parts of, the, of a, neither of the two subsystems, in our case, neither of the two photons, can really be thought of as having a state of its own. Whatever you mean by a quantum state, or whatever you understand by a quantum state, it is only the kind of thing that can be shared by the two photons. Now, there's some applications where you want entangled photons. Okay, that actually gives you a resource in quantum information processing uh, because you have that entanglement, and it's usually a resource when you have that entanglement at a distance because then you can do things you, that you can't otherwise do classically. Okay? Sometimes you would just like one photon, thank you very much, because there's lots of things you can do with that. Okay? And in that case, you want to, you're generating two photons, you detect one to let you know the other one's there, and there you would like the two photons to essentially both have the same state. Okay? That is, they each have a state, and it's the same as the other one. So that when you detect one, you know immediately what the other one is. Good. <laughs> That's a little rough. <laughs> That's it. So, uh, John is here until the end of the week, and I have to say, just to end your comment on collaboration, if we want to get in touch with you, we give you a ring. That's right. Or email me. <laughs> but a big ring. A big ring, not a little one.